Shalom from Jerusalem. Uh, this is Watchman Talk, a series of conversations with uh, people who have played a key part in various uh, aspects dealing with Israel's security. Usually it is Israeli defense forces, officers, or diplomatic or intelligence officials. But this time we are pleased and honored to have as very special guest, retired, recently retired General Kenneth Frank McKenzie Jr. Welcome, sir, General. I'm delighted to be with you here today. Thank you. Uh, and um, we are uh, seeing you uh, in your office in uh, the uh, University of South Florida, where uh, you had uh, the uh, Institute of uh, Global and Security Affairs. Is that approximately uh, the name? That is correct. Here at the University of South Florida, I am the executive director of the Global and National Security Institute, and I'm also the executive director of the Florida Center for Cybersecurity. Both of these organizations are within the university here. And you're also affiliated with the Middle East uh, Institute, MEI, and um, we have uh, been following uh, some of your um, uh, panel discussions um, on MEI uh, too, and um, we are, as I said, uh, delighted uh, to have you. Now, you're um, a former, if that is the right word, Marine Corps officer, if one ever leaves uh, the Marines. Go ahead, sir. So, so we actually, we, we think we never leave the Marines. I'm the former commander of U.S. Central Command, but I, uh, and while I'm no longer on active duty, I will always be a U.S. Marine. Now, people abroad, outside of the United States, uh, might wonder, uh, not uh, being privy to the uh, storied history of the Marine Corps ever since the first days of the Republic, why uh, there is still a need for a separate corps. They know that uh, this is part of the Department of the Navy, but um, it is not really equal in size or in stature even to the um, services, Army, Navy, and Air Force. So please tell us first, why did you decide to join the Marines rather than any of the other branches? Well, you know, the Marine Corps over the last uh, 247 years has carved out a niche for itself as uh, a premier expeditionary force. We can get there the first. Uh, we can get there when there's still immature logistics, when the situation is very uncertain. We typically arrive with our partner, the U.S. Navy, although in the past you know, few decades we've become increasingly joint. But we like to think of ourselves as the first people to have boots on the ground, and we can pave the way for others to enter. And while we are you know, the smallest of all the services, I think uh, the fact of the senior leadership positions that the Marine Corps has filled over the past few years, most recently with General Joe Dunford, who is chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, we certainly stand the equal of any of our, uh, any of our service partners. Now, uh, you uh, were born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, the uh, southern part of the United States is obviously uh, pro-military, many uh, military bases uh, and uh, some family traditions. What were your reasons uh, uh, for choosing a military career? You know, there's not a particular military tradition in my family. My father served honorably as an enlisted soldier in the Korean War in the U.S. Army. And uh, but there's not a particular there's not a particular heritage. My great grandfather was a private soldier in the U.S. Army, and during the First World War, he guarded Puget Sound in the state of Washington. And I'm sure he did a very good job, but did not actually get to Europe. And uh, and my great great grandfather was a private soldier in the 16th Alabama during the uh, during the American Civil War. So not a particular heritage. Uh, we're happy to serve and did serve honorably, but uh, not a lot of interest in it. And I. It's, 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 that's a good question. I don't know why. I, I couldn't put my finger on what drove me to serve in, in the U.S. military and in the Marine Corps in particular, except I can tell you it was a, it was a long-term goal and objective of mine. I, uh, I always wanted to be a Marine. I've never regretted that decision. And uh, as you know, I ended up serving 42 years, 10 months, and a handful of days in the Marine Corps. And it was, and obviously will be the central uh, point of my life, and uh, certainly something I've drawn great, great pride and uh, I've drawn great pride from. Young uh, Americans who want to be career officers 
usually try uh, to get uh, an appointment to a service academy, West Point, Annapolis, the uh, Air Force Academy, but you chose the Citadel um, in South Carolina, where you went to uh, the Neville ROTC. So that was um, a more difficult part uh, to be uh, a commissioned officer, wasn't it? It was a little different. I, you know, I wanted to measure, I wanted to go to a school with a liberal arts uh, curriculum. And the Citadel, despite being a state military college, had a liberal arts curriculum. My undergraduate with major was English, and I learned how to write and read uh, at, at, uh, at, the, at the Citadel to a degree that has served me very well throughout the rest of my career. Uh, I, I will note my son also was a Marine officer. He did go to the Naval Academy, was commissioned, and like me, was an infantry officer and uh, went to Afghanistan a couple of times. But I chose to I chose to go to the Citadel. That's another decision I've never regretted. The friendships I, I made there, the, the relationships have served me well over the over the many decades since we graduated in May of 1979. And a friend of yours from the Marine Corps is now the president of uh, the Citadel, isn't uh, he? Another Marine Corps yeah, general. My good friend, uh, Marine General uh, Glenn Bluto Walters, is uh, is the president of the college, and they couldn't have a better president. He's a brilliant guy, test pilot, uh, aviator, uh, long term, you know, fantastic leader in the Marine Corps, and he's doing great things at the college now. Now, as you uh, stepped up the ladder of command, uh, including staff positions, and we know um, you were in uh, key positions, first of all, uh, commanding troops, and then uh, taking part um, with the uh, commandant of uh, the uh, Marine Corps, two commandants uh, to be exact, and uh, as part of the uh, quadrennial uh, uh, report review. Um, so uh, let's jump to your um, posts in the Central Command before becoming the head of CENTCOM, because you were uh, obviously the director of, of plans and operations, uh, if I'm uh, not uh, wrong, and later you commanded the marine component of uh, CENTCOM. What did you find when you got to CENTCOM? So I came in 2010 and became the director of strategy, plans, and policy, the J-5 at, at Central Command. We would, so we would call that job. You're the you're the senior planner and the senior strategist for the command. And I had the very good luck of having as my CENTCOM commander, uh, General Jim Mattis. So two year experience standing at standing with him, learning from him, watching him command. And he, he was a masterful, brilliant commander. And so that gave me a very strong grounding in the theater, which I had as a colonel before, because I'd been to the theater several times, Afghanistan and Iraq, but it gave me a broadened appreciation for all of the other factors that go into play at the combatant command level. So that was a that was a great opportunity to just watch him operate, to be his planner, to be have the opportunity to be in the room with him as he made decisions. It was a wonderful learning experience. And as you noted, I came back a couple of years later, this time as a lieutenant general, a three-star general, and I commanded the Marine Forces in Central Command, one of the one of the component commanders in Central Command. Now, the United States organizes its combatant commands functionally. There's an air component commander, ground component commander, maritime component commander. So typically, the, the Marine component doesn't get one of those uh, big functional commands. But what you instead have the opportunity to do is play utility infielder for the commander. And my commander, when I was at Central Command at that time, was, of course, General Austin. And he was another uh, remarkable commander that it was a good experience to work for. And I was able to do a lot of things for him where we could respond very quickly, go to places where he needed assistance or to send a senior leader with a headquarters who could take charge should it be needed. So it was in both of those opportunities really gave me a, a good grounding in the Central Command region, its history, uh, the cultures that interact there, because it's a it's a profoundly complex environment, as you as you know very well. So a great opportunity for me. So you mentioned the uh, the only two uh, generals, the uh, two recently retired generals, after General Marshall, uh, to have been given the exemption, uh, which allowed them to serve as uh, secretaries of defense. Uh, Secretary Mattis and Secretary Austin, who is still uh, serving uh, as uh, we speak now. And um, as you uh, well know, because this was the time approximately when you entered um, service, uh, when CENTCOM was uh, uh, set up, 
or even before that, the Rapid Deployment uh, Joint Task Force, uh, it was an opportunity for the Army and the Marines to rotate commanders, um, and Mattis was Marines, Austin was uh, uh, Army, and except for one Navy officer, Admiral Fallon, uh, it was always uh, such a rotation. So you knew that uh, you might uh, one day get uh, your hands on, on CENTCOM, uh, didn't you? Well, I, I, you know, you, you hope, you, you, you want to have the opportunity to command, you get, and it's an honor to follow the footsteps of guys like uh, Lloyd Austin and Jim Mattis and the other fine commanders who have commanded its central command. And, and you're right, when the central, when the headquarters was originally established, it was in, it intended to rotate between Army and Marines. It, in general, it did for a while, and now it's typically been more Army than Marines, but Marine officers do have an opportunity to compete to command it, and it, it just worked out for me that, 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 that I had the opportunity to do that. Now, in your, in your uh, earlier jobs, these two jobs uh, at CENTCOM, as well as your jobs on the Joint Staff as J5, and then Director of the Joint Staff, which is really the most important uh, position um, on the staff and, and the sure path to a uh, fourth star, how did you view the Israeli Defense Forces? So, uh, I've always had a great relationship going back to, uh, actually, even before that, in 19... 19- 90, in December of 1998, I was a lieutenant colonel and a, and a battalion commander, a battalion landing team commander. And I had the opportunity to bring a battalion ashore at Haifa, move the battalion down to the Negev, and conduct a large two-week exercise in December of that year. Uh, 1,200 Marines down there. We had everything. We had tanks. We had artillery, all under my command, all maneuvering with the ranges that the uh, that the idea provided us. So that was really my first opportunity to work w- work with the IDF. In fact, the IDF actually brought down a platoon of Merkavas for us to maneuver with, so we could get a sense of how Merkavas and and M1A ones would uh, maneuver together. So that was really my first experience with uh, going ashore in Israel. I had an opportunity to do some social and cultural events, so it was a it was a very rewarding professional experience because I was able to train my battalion to a very high level of readiness and a very high standard down in the desert, but also an opportunity to spend some time around Haifa and see some cultural things there. It made a very big impression on me, on my officers, and on the young Marines of the battalion. So it really started then. And then later on, I continued those relationships, but really beginning in 2010, of course, when I was the J-5, had an opportunity to meet with peers uh, in, uh, in the IDF and we had a lot of mutual issues, even though, as you know, it wasn't until last year that, that Central Command actually, that Israel actually moved into the Central Command region. And we can talk about that in a little bit, if, if you'd like. But despite that, you know, obviously, most of Israel's threats come from the east. So they're looking into the Central Command region. So CENTCOM has always had deep ties with Israel even though they were in the European command area of responsibility. And as you know, threats don't respect boundaries. They don't respect maps. They don't respect wiring diagrams. So you have to be adept and adroit as you manage those relationships. But really, from 2010 on, uh, I've known a succession of officers uh, inside the IDF that I would consider friends and had an opportunity to, to work with them on a lot of projects. And it was very rewarding for us, and I believe for them as well. So General Gantz and then General Eisenkot and now General Kohavi, uh, they have all supervised operations in your area of responsibility against Daesh, uh, obviously against uh, Iran and its proxies. Um, did you um, command operations which were uh, joint at least intelligence-wise, if not operationally? So uh, we, we, we share information. We share information. We share intelligence with Israel uh, on, a, on a broad variety of things, as we do with other partners in the region. But we, we, you know, we, we have a very special relationship with Israel. That's a very important relationship for us. So I have shared that information. I would not say anything. I can't say anything more about operations. But I can tell you that we have a very robust uh, you know, intelligence relationship. And now that they're in the Central Command region, that's even more important and has opened the portal, I think, for them to have a deeper relationship with many of the other nations in the region, which I think is a goal we would all like to work toward. Uh, It is said that there is a mechanism uh, um, whose acronym is ICE, Israel or IDF, CENTCOM, UCOM, 
um, which meets at the chateau um, of the um, uh, Yukon commander in, in Belgium. You uh, obviously took part in, in those meetings. Those were a very important series of, uh, of meetings that went on for several years. Because, you know, when, during the period of time when Israel was in Yukon, you know, they had formal relationships with Yukon, and they, they also had relationships with us. So what you had to do was manage a three-body problem. And I think commanders of Central Command, European Command, and the IDF did a very good job of balancing, you know, in, in a very complex environment, a very complex, friendly environment. And we've already talked about the depth of complexity that the enemy threat uh, presents. But there are two other elements in the U.S. military, and that is the um, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff and SOCOM, uh, which uh, have a seat at the table um, there. Absolutely. So, you know, the chain of command for a combatant commander uh, runs through the Secretary of Defense to the President. So the, 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 the Joint Staff is not directly in the chain of command. But the Chairman is a very important, he's the senior military officer in the United States, and so you really, a combatant commander wants to know and have a very good relationship with the chairman and the joint staff, which actually serves him. And so I worked, I had the opportunity to see that firsthand when I was the director of the joint staff, you know, and, and the J-5 and then the director, and then as a combatant commander. So yes, the, 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 the joint staff is very much in that relationship as well, as is Special Operations Command, because of the forces they have in the theater which are typically under the operational control of Central Command when they're in the theater for operations. But nonetheless, they're a large, uh, SOCOM is an, is an organization that is not only a combatant commander, as you know, but also has service-like uh, characteristics. By that, I mean the requirement to raise, uh, train, equip forces as well. So, they, so guys like General Rich Clark, who was my peer for much of my time at at Central Command, not only was a combatant commander with global responsibilities, whereas mine were regional, he also had what we call Title 10 responsibilities, putting the force together, training it, making sure it's equipped properly to be presented to the consumer. And I was the consumer as a regional combatant commander. And he went on to uh, command uh, SOCOM. Um, can you uh, tell us uh, something about the operation to kill Qassam Soleimani? Uh, it happened uh, on your watch in Iraq, directed uh, uh, from the White House. Can you tell us at least something about the Israeli aspect to it? Well, I, I will say this. Um, Qassam Soleimani posed a direct threat to us, to other countries in the region, and to United States citizens in Iraq. And ultimately, when we took the decision to, to take the strike, we felt the risk of inaction was greater than the risk, correction, the risk of inaction was greater than the risk of action. So always you're balancing a number of things like that. You're dealing with intelligence with all kinds of friends and partners in the region. And certainly uh, the Israelis have always been very helpful to us in that regard. Uh, and I really can't tell you a whole lot more about it, except I would say this. I've had a lot of time to reflect on that strike since the day it occurred. It was the right thing to do then. It remains the right thing to do now. The Iranians uh, have said that uh, they uh, will take revenge upon those Americans uh, who are responsible uh, for the strike. Uh, have you been threatened uh, directly, personally? Well, you've seen what they've said publicly, so it would be, uh, I would have to say yes, since the Iranians have been very public about it. And I'll, I'll leave it there. I will say that uh, I... I uh, my safety is well is well looked after, and I'm very comfortable with the precautions that have been taken to, to ensure that uh, the Iranian threats, their, their threats against a number of people, won't come to fruition. Uh, recently, uh, you and the entire area of Tampa, Florida, underwent um, uh, Hurricane Ian. Uh, if you add only one letter R, you get Iran. Um, how? How uh, threatening uh, is Iran, and what were ro your recommendations regarding the so-called credible military threat um, uh, at Iran so that it will not go nuclear? You know, it, it missed Tampa. It, uh, unfortunately and tragically, it hit down south and did a lot of damage down there, but it did actually miss us. And sometimes that's the way the Iranians operate, too. There may be a, a deep moral there that I'm probably not the one to talk about here as, as we speak today. You asked to talk a little bit about Iran, and so my point would be this. Over the last 10 years, and accelerating over the last five years, 
Iran has uh, put remarkable emphasis on building a trinity of capabilities. And that trinity is composed of theater range ballistic missiles, land attack cruise missiles, and unmanned aerial vehicles or UAVs. And what they have done is they have, they have starved their people, they have perverted their economy, and they have denied a lot of things in order to build these capabilities to the point now where we really have a new situation in the region where I will tell you the latter part of my time as the commander of Central Command and from what I see now, the great daily threat in the region is what comes of these three allied Iranian capabilities. Because what it does is it gives them the ability to gain overmatch against their Gulf neighbors. The range of their missiles is, they have a few that can hit Israel, not a whole lot. Although, as you know, they're trying to build more and they're trying to put more into, into Lebanon as well. So that's a, that's, that's a concern but they have the, the thousands and thousands of theater ballistic missiles, which give them the ability to really in, uh, impose a tremendous uh, burden on their neighbors should they choose to do that. That's very concerning. And I think that's, you know, in the spring of 2021, we were talking about going back into the JICPOA, uh, reestablishing some form of a nuclear agreement. And then from the United States, uh, our president said, then we'd like to look at ballistic missiles and proxies. Well, the Iranian response was electric, and it wasn't so much about the nuclear component as about the ballistic missiles and the proxy component, saying they will never, ever allow modification or, you know, we, we'll never negotiate to reduce these capabilities. I think we should view the crown jewel of Iranian offensive capability as those missiles, UAVs, and land attack cruise missiles, because they pose a, they pose a threat tonight. The nuclear threat, uh, the Iranians continue to plot along. You know, they could have a weapon probably pretty quick if they chose to do that. It would take them a while to deliver a, to present a deliverable weapon. By that, I mean something that could be weaponized and put on top of a missile or hauled in an airplane somewhere. That's going to take them a little time to do once they make the decision to do it. On the other hand, these missiles, LACMs and UAVs are available now. And I sometimes am concerned that they sit in the shadow because we focus so much on the nuclear deal, which is concerning and is the policy of my country that Iran not possess a nuclear weapon. But in the meantime, Iran has built significant ballistic missile capability. And the last point I would make on ballistic missiles is in January of 2020, when they launched an attack on us at Al-Assad, their missiles were accurate to within tens of meters of their target. That's a huge increase in accuracy. And they've only improved since January of 2020. They're probably more accurate now, more capable. And this trend is going to continue. And I find it uh, one of the most concerning trends in the region. Now, that, that um, uh, attack which you uh, referred to uh, only caused uh, some uh, wounded American, American soldiers, servicemen, uh, mostly concussions uh, and stuff like that. And uh, had there been fatalities, you were ready to launch an attack on Iran proper? So we believe the Iranians were not trying to avoid casualties with that attack. We were able to take some actions that allowed us to, to prevent the, the attack from being worse than it was. Uh, commanders on the ground did a great job of repositioning. So they hit the targets they wanted. The targets were just not full of people when those targets were hit. And that's, that's a hats off to the guys on the ground that, 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 that did that. It's a remarkable, remarkable effort by leadership on the ground. Uh, we were prepared to respond as we were, I'm sure, we're prepared to respond today should something happen. And so what happened was we, we, we dodged that bullet, if you will, because of our ability to, 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 to maneuver quickly and adroitly. The Iranians not as nimble because they were not, again, I emphasize, they were not trying to avoid casualties. They were trying to hit targets. They were trying to hurt and kill Americans. Now, uh, what's the uh, best case and worst case scenario? You obviously analyzed uh, what could happen if Israel uh, tried to strike the Iranian nuclear infrastructure, whether with American approval or without it. Could Israel have taken out uh, the um, Iranian targets or would it have caused a drawn out war? I think a strike against Iran by anybody that goes into the, what we would call the the Esfahan, Tehran corridor, where all most of their nuclear stuff is, any strike in there by any outside body, whether it's the United States, Israel, or some other some other uh, group of nations, Iran's going to respond violently, aggressively, 
and, and with as much firepower as they can to that. I can't see how they can do anything else. So that that's going to happen. So then you have to think, can you actually get at the program? The program is much, difficult, much more difficult to look at than it was 10 years ago when I first examined it in 2010. Uh, they've done some things to make it much harder to, to, to get after. Um, I know that I, I'm certain that the Israelis think a lot about it. I, knew, I know that we thought a lot about it at U.S. Central Command. Uh, it would be a difficult target, and you would just need to think about, can you be successful? What is the likely Iranian response? And I've described to you what I think the likely Iran, the worst response would probably be the most likely response. They will hit back heavily uh, against where they think the strike came from. They will do, they will take aggressive measures because they believe it will be necessary to do that to protect the survival of the regime. So your, your recommendation would be to do it only as a last resort? I think, you know, there are a lot of cards on the table you'd want to play before you got to that point. There's still diplomatic cards out there to be played. I think that would be one of the very last things that you would want to do. Now, CENTCOM, of course, had responsibility for Afghanistan, and you were there uh, during the uh, withdrawal. And um, uh, we don't have to uh, go uh, into uh, the uh, recriminations, but uh, what is uh, your lesson from the uh, summer of 2021, and what's your advice for the future? Well, so the summer of 2021 was a three-month history in a 21-year war. So what brought us to the summer of 2021 didn't begin to occur in May of that year. I think you certainly recognize that. So I, you know, I have some very specific thoughts about what we did at the end. Um, you know, my recommendation, uh, it remains my opinion today, is we should not have completely left. We had the capability, I believe, to keep a small platform in there that would allow the government of Afghanistan to, to continue to, to continue to fight, would have allowed us to continue to work. Our primary objective, which was the counter-terrorist targets of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, we didn't choose to do that. Coupling that with the decision to leave our embassy and a lot of people in until very late created the tactical circumstances that allowed, you know, that, that created what happened in the, in, the, in the second and third weeks of August. And, and those, those were decisions that could have been different and might have resulted in different things. But I think writ large, you know, going back to, you know, to 2001, you know, we made decisions then about the nature of the government of Afghanistan. We had an opportunity in 2001, 2002 to either co-opt the Taliban or to completely destroy the Taliban. We chose not to do that. Uh, we chose to turn our attention to Iraq. 2003, 2004, which had a profound effect on our, our, our attention span against Afghanistan and allowed things to happen there over a period of years. We never solved the sanctuary problem from an adjacent country. And of course, I'm talking about Pakistan. All of those things and so many more over a 20 year period led us to the end. And, you know, what I wish it were different, certainly I wish it were different. I went there several times. My son went there twice. Um, and people lost family members, loved ones there that have far more, far more sorrow uh, than I could even hope to dream of uh, because of what happened there. So that's a we're still digesting that. I can tell you, I personally am still thinking about it. I think about it a lot. I wish it had gone differently. Uh, but I think we just need to be very open minded when we think about it. And so that I'll, I'll simply end my comments by saying when you go into something like that, you need to have a clear-eyed view of why you're there. Now, the Israeli Defense Forces um, uh, are tam sometimes uh, compared to the Marines because of uh, the air ground uh, team and uh, the size uh, of the force. Uh, what's your general impression of the IDF? Capable, tough, uh, no nonsense, good planners, good executors, uh, easy people to work with. Uh, any particular uh, officers um, that come to mind? Well, a lot, a lot that I've known down through the years. I'm particularly fond of General Kohavi. Uh, we've had opportunity to work throughout my period of time in command. I, he's, a, he's a great paratrooper and uh, no nonsense. He, he typifies, he typifies in so many ways the professionalism of the IDF. And Israel is lucky to have patriots and officers like him. Uh, did you have time uh, when there was uh, a sort of a combined uh, uh, operation, not only joint, um, meaning uh, an American uh, inter-service operation, with General Kohavi or uh, another chief of staff uh, running together an operation? No, we had the opportunity to do a lot of planning together. 
listen to our, you know, come, come in at the end after our staffs had done a lot of planning, but I did not have the opportunity to conduct a joint operation of any kind with it. No, I did not. Is there a civil military uh, crisis in the United States following what happened over the last couple of years, including January 6th? I don't believe so. I believe that, uh, you know, a fundamental characteristic of the American military is to be apolitical, stay out of the political process. And I think uh, in, with General Dunford and now General Milley, the, the, the Joint Force has worked very hard to ensure that we serve uh, designated elected civilian leadership. It's a very bad thing when people mention the military in the same breath as a kind of a political decision. Uh, you know, I, I would just say this, political leaders make these decisions. They have the right to be wrong. And even if they're wrong in their decision, they have the absolute right to expect we're going to execute their orders unless those orders are unlawful or illegal. And that is something that we strive very hard to do. And it's a constant process of education and mentoring with, with subordinates to make sure everybody sees it that way. I believe we do. So I don't, I don't actually think there's a crisis in civil mill relations in the United States. I know pundits write about it and it's exciting to talk about sort of breathlessly, but I think it's much ado about nothing. Now, perceptions, of course, um, have an impact, uh, you would agree, General. And uh, what happened over the last uh, three administrations, uh, starting with Obama, then Trump, now Biden, is the pivot to another area, the Indo-Pacific uh, area. Um, and we have seen, as we mentioned, uh, Afghanistan. And now the national security, national strategy document, uh, and uh, followed by the national defense uh, strategy document, they all point to the Middle East being relegated to perhaps fourth or fifth place after China, Russia, um, even um, uh, the Western Hemisphere. Um, so what should uh, people in this region uh, believe about the United States, this over the horizon uh, doctrine? Uh, are the Americans out of the region, or are you still here only in a backseat? So if you're going to be a global power, and the United States is a global power, you have to think globally. You, you no longer have the luxury of thinking purely regionally. And as our, for, as our capacity advantage over potential foes has eroded, fewer things compared to those that the Chinese can produce and that the Russians throw into the field, uh, those, though you have to be very smart on how you, where you position your forces and how you use your forces. So, look, I, I completely agree with the idea that China is the long-term facing threat for the United States. Their words, their language, the, the things they're doing are, are of great concern to us. So we need to, we need to be on watch for that. Russia right now is a profoundly threatening short-term problem. And it may morph into a longer term problem. I don't know the answer to that. But they have a significant nuclear capability. And you always have to respect capability. I believe, though, that we still have vital interests in this region, regions with friends like Israel and other partners in the region. We have a, we have a strategic interest in the free flow of commerce through the Strait of Hormuz, through the Bab el Mandeb, through the Suez Canal. That's going to require that we remain in the region. We also have committed to Iran not producing a nuclear weapon. Look, we're going to have to be smart and nimble as we balance our forces. But at the same time, I think it's important that we assure our friends in the region that the United States is going to remain around and be here for the long haul. I tried to do that while I was the CENTCOM commander. I believe my successor is doing that. And I believe through engagement above the level of the military, that message is also being, is also being passed. Now, we are Cent at a very dangerous moment in history right now, but we can't turn our back on the Middle East. Now, CENTCOM is mostly an air and naval and perhaps marines and special forces arena. The Pacific is mostly naval uh, with air. But Europe is a land front. And we see the Ukraine uh, war right now. What's your uh, professional uh, uh, lesson? What are your professional lessons from the war so far? Well, first of all, you know, the Russian military has been exposed uh, as not being nearly as effective as we thought it would be. And I think as you look deeply into it, it's the lack of an NCO, a non-commissioned officer organization that allows orders to be carried out. Those young men and women are the people who actually make things happen. Russia doesn't have one. And we, we, we sort of suspected that, but now we know it. And that's why their forces are not able to perform effectively. I think also, you know, I think President Putin went into this war 
without without listening to advice from probably his military, because I don't think he listens to it at all. And so I think he's in a little bit of a, a, a corner right now. It is concerning uh, to us. It should be concerning because his instinct will be to try to escalate his way out of it. He's rapidly running out of reasonable tools that he can use to escalate the crisis in order to find a way out. And so that I am concerned about where we are right now in Ukraine. I look at it from a distance. I'm no better informed than anybody else who reads The Economist or The New York Times or The Wall Street Journal. Uh, but I am very concerned about the direction it's taken. But you did uh, watch the um, Russians um, at work in Syria uh, during the uh, uh, Syrian civil war and their intervention. And actually, some of their commanders there are now running the show uh, in the Ukraine. Yes, and, and Syria was a much smaller theater. And so I think it was a lot easier for them to, uh, you know, to operate in Syria. Additionally, there was nobody fighting back. Uh, you know, ISIS had some capability to fight back, but not great. Uh, the Ukrainians, on the other hand, are fighting back like lions. And it's always a lot harder when the other fellow is shooting at you. They were shooting at them in Syria, not very efficiently. So I think uh, the lessons we observed about the Russians in Syria don't actually have a lot of parallels to what's going on in Ukraine right now. Now, as you said, you are running a, a cyber or counter cyber institute. Uh, is cyber the panacea? Could uh, someone just uh, uh, push enter and the lights will go out um, in your adversaries uh, uh, back home? Well, I, I would tell you this. Cyber is at least as demanding a domain as space. It is almost as limitless as space. And it's much easier to have significant offensive capabilities than it is to have defensive capabilities. And modern society, particularly democratic societies, have to have, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to have access to the internet, you've got to have access to other things. Uh, other societies, closed societies like China, of course, will try to shut that down. But we still need, we still need the internet for the education of our people, for a variety of things. We also need it from a technical sense in order to run the U.S. military. So that is something that we, we hope to do better on. We have, again, the United States is a giant with a strong right, right hook in cyber, but we also have a glass jaw. So we have to be very careful uh, about that going forward. Well, uh, China uh, trying to invade uh, Taiwan. Um, do you see it as a distinct possibility? I think it's a possibility, um, but I'm not a China expert. I think China is watching what's going on in Ukraine right now. And I think the best thing we can do actually to convince China that they don't want to invade Taiwan is to continue to assemble a group of nations committed to collective security. And by, by that, I mean NATO and other like-minded nations that will stand together to defend themselves. That's the one disadvantage that Russia and China uh, labor under. They have no group, they have no other nations around them to give them that moral authority and help. Where that, on the other hand, that is the unique asymmetric advantage that, that our nations have is that we will stand together. And that has been extremely useful uh, in the Ukraine uh, conflict, and it would be extremely useful in the Middle East as well. General uh, Frank McKenzie, thank you very much for, as your name uh, expresses, speaking frankly to us here on uh, Watchmen Talk on TV7 News Israel. We're delighted uh, to uh, have had you, and we hope that you will come back um, sometime soon for another such uh, encounter. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It was a great discussion today, and I really appreciate it. You're, you're a good interviewer, and I look forward to doing this again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.